only 50 years ago, more than 20,000 black rhinos roamed across Kenya. But by the 1980s, poaching had decimated the population to fewer than 300 individuals. To me, the most amazing thing about rhinos is how much they love each other. Since then, intense conservation efforts have helped the recovery of the rhino population. I love my job, it's a wonderful opportunity. From day one, life has never been the same. It's been a strong learning curve. I love animals, I love wildlife. I think if I was given another opportunity, I would still choose the same thing, doing wildlife conservation. This week on Wildlife Warriors, join me and conservationist Ian Lemayan as we delve into the world of the black rhino. The latest research shows that the world has lost over 60% of her species in just the last 45 years. That's in my lifetime. We are now at a crisis point. I'm here in Lower Conservancy in central Kenya, home to the black rhinoceros. When I was born, there were over 25,000 of these animals. Today, there are fewer than 1,000. These animals have been poached and killed only for their horns. They are demanded in other countries half a world away, China and Vietnam, where it's believed that if you consume the horns, you'll be cured of a headache. These myths have led to the decimation of rhinos around the world. Africa has already lost the western black rhino, and the northern white rhino has been reduced to just two individuals. I'm at Lower. This is Kenya's most important private conservation area. It was once owned by an individual family. Today, this is a conservation area owned by a trust for the people of Kenya. It is a catalyst of conservation in this part of the country, and they have had enormous success. That's why I'm here. I've come to meet Ian Lemayan, Kenyan scientist who's helping to save rhinos. Hi. Hi, Paula. How are you? How oh, are my. you? It's been a long time. Yeah, it's been a long time. Good to see you. Good and to you. see you. Welcome to Lewa. Thank you. Yeah, so let's go. Let's go. I'll show you around. So how many rhinos are there now in Lewa? Uh, right now, Lewa Burana, we have over 160. Oh that my is, uh, God, yeah. that's amazing. So we're doing really well in terms of uh, getting our calves up and our uh, breeding performance is, is good. I first um, knew about rhinos when I got into Kenya Wildlife Service as a volunteer. There was this book, which was the national strategy for the rhinos, and there was this number of rhinos have been poached this year, this number of rhinos have survived this year. And I was like, why are they just talking about this particular animal? Like, is it, why is it of interest? And um, I came across my first rhino in Nairobi National Park, and um, it was such a beautiful sight. Knock, knock. <laughs> this is the operations room. And she's in action right now. And there's also somebody calling on this other station. Got zero send over. Azulu six, got zero. This is one of the most sophisticated operation rooms in any of the conservancies in Kenya, and it obviously works. Purity is the operations manager. Ian and many others are on the ground, tracking the animals, protecting them day and night. This 
work is 24 7 and it obviously works the rhinos are thriving 10 babies have been born this year alone and we haven't had any poaching incidents wow so Thanks. So what's happening? Um, so right now, actually what was just going on is uh, a ranger confirming a rhino that they had seen. Um, it's usually like on Lewa and Borana, we usually say, um, when you're reporting a rhino, you must report physically that you've seen the rhinos, that you've identified positively through the earmarks, through any form of identification that you, you can identify that animal. So we are usually very strict on citing the animal before you. You report. So, so he's called in to say, I've just seen it? Yes, he's called in to say, I've just seen so and so. He's in this body condition, he's here and he's doing well and this is his activity. And um, once that happens, we're able to kind of like put it down on our data sheets. Here we actually kind of like have a screen that we are able to kind of like monitor the whole of Lewa and the whole of Borana. Wow. Because are those all the rhinos? No, those are all the rangers. So this <laughs> means that all our rhinos are safe because as you can see, Lower Borana, we have our rangers scattered all over. So these are their call signs, Foxtrot 1, uh -huh, Zulu 8. Zulu 8, all those. Whiskey Lower. Romeo, that's Whiskey a nice Romeo. name. <laughs> yeah. So what would happen if a, a poacher crossed into Lewa right now and maybe Romeo 2 Bravo spotted that poacher? Romeo 2 Bravo spots and calls this operations room. Once they call this operations room, then this operations room disseminates the information to the, the people who are involved. That means the head of security, the rhino teams, so that we can be able to convene and be able to make a plan to intercept them before they do any harm. And this is usually done so fast and the poacher is taken care of, at least he's taken away. So he's arrested? Yeah, he's definitely going to be arrested. And, um, but mostly we have not had poaching for the last five years. Although Ian and his team have been successful at keeping poachers out of Lewa, the crisis across the continent continues. We're losing about four rhinos a day and maybe 15 elephants in a day in Africa. This could be the loss of an entire species if nothing is done, you know. And things are not okay. Uh, things need to be done and we need to protect our animals all over Africa, in home, at our home here in Kenya. And uh, though we've not lost any rhinos on Lewa, other places have not been so lucky. And um, it's sad that uh, we are losing animals at even this age because people by now should have known the value of these animals. They should make a personal connection with wildlife and you'll see why we're trying to conserve them. All right, so we're going to go to the southern parts of Lewa right now um, so that we also don't miss the rhinos and also we also don't get very clean with the rain so it look like <laughs> it's looking be beautiful storm. oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> hopefully we get some good rains we need it <laughs> okay is this your car yep nice The Lower Conservancy is a very special place because the local communities are allowed to bring their cattle to graze. This is especially important during the dry seasons. To our left, you can see humans and you can see cows and you can see sheep and shorts. Yes, yeah. But on our right, there's a rhino lying down there. Oh my God! That's a male white rhino. Wow, and it's just hundreds, hundreds of meters from people. Yep. Um, so this is Owen. He's a fully grown uh, white rhino male, 19.8 years. Right now he weighs almost uh, 1.5 tons and um, he's the boss of this territory. Seriously Ian, that is a huge horn. Yeah, yeah. That rhino's horn must uh -huh. weigh several kilograms. Yeah. And we are just literally about maybe 200 meters, not even 200 meters, from people grazing cattle. Yeah. Surely he's not safe. He is safe. On Lewa, we've done our best to help the communities. And so the communities have become our own wildlife warriors, such that in case of anything that happens to these animals, they'll call us and tell us, hey, we have rhino so and so here, and you guys need to come and have a look. And because of that good relationship that we have with the community, they have become our protectors. They are our first line of defense now. I still can't believe how close to Owen these people are. And that is because he is a white rhino. White rhinos are very docile. 
unlike the black rhinos, which are one of the most aggressive and dangerous animals in Africa. And there are plenty of them right here in Lewa. We are on a quest to find the black rhinos. Given their size, you'd think they'd be easy to find. But sometimes you have to look for clues. Ian decides to stop and do something that I would never have thought of doing. But it looks like elephant dung. Yeah, it somehow looks like elephant dung. But elephants don't kick the dung. This one has been kicked, you can see. He spread it? Yes, so this must be a territorial bull. And territorial bulls, when they put the dung, they kick it to spread it and make sure that anywhere they go, then their scent is on the ground. So if any other male or any other rhino that comes across his trail, they can be able to tell who this rhino is, how old he is, and also what sex it is, and be able to know, like, should I go leave this territory or should I stay? But why do they put so much dung in one place? Um, it's kind of like uh, to mark their territory. Are you serious? Yes. You're holding fresh? I'm holding fresh. Green poop? -poo? Green poop. <laughs> so just to try and see what that they've been feeding on. You can see there's a lot of grass in there. Mm -hmm. But, Can't you smell it? Yeah, I can smell it, but this is what uh, Rhino is all about, finding out what the information. So I, I guess uh, <laughs> criteria number one to be a Rhino scientist, have no sense of smell. <laughs> <laughs> yep, <laughs> but it's not too bad, it's really good, because it's just grass <laughs> and a lot of trees. <laughs> Ian is one of those wonderful positive conservationists who is always laughing but talk to him about poaching and his whole demeanor changes. Why do people poach rhinos? Um, it, it baffles me because it's not logical to kill an animal uh, for its horn, for the uh, superstition that it has medicinal value. And um, it's the same material as keratin, nails, hair, and it, it really baffles me. When I think about poaching, I think about people stopping a whole generation of um, a family line because rhinos are like animals with feelings. They have feelings, they have emotions, they have bonds. All of those families are tied to each other. And when you break um, the biggest uh, rhino for its horn, then you leave this other one, juveniles or the young ones, without any sense of direction. Have you ever come across a rhino that's been poached? Yes, sadly yes. It was it was a five year old five year old rhino, just new, which has been introduced to a brand new place. And then within a few months, you know his his mother was killed and then we thought that that's gonna, he's gonna survive, she's gonna survive, and it never did, it never did. You see he's shrugged off this way, and you can see like some prints there, it's like he's gone off that way. So come on, let's go find this guy. Okay. <laughs> This landscape is absolutely amazing. So where are we going, Ian? Um, right now we, were, we are going to see a black rhino and uh, try and track one and see how uh, we track them by foot. So, oh, we're going to go on foot? Yeah. It's not dangerous? <laughs> <laughs> we are safe. We'll be very safe. We'll be very careful. And um, this is just one of the things that the rangers do out there just to make sure that they have a positive ID of the animal that they're reporting. So will be rangers this time. We have to be a little bit careful and also we don't want to bother them and we don't want to also want them to smell us. 
if they are uncomfortable, they get stressed. But like if they are not, they don't even know that we are there, then that's a good thing. But if they, they come, what? We climb a tree? We have to climb a tree. <laughs> I hope you're ready for climbing trees. I, uh, <laughs> I can't remember the last time I climbed a tree. I'm not sure I could do it. <laughs> uh, what's happening with the habitat in this area? You know, climate change is affecting a lot of things. And um, so it's getting drier and drier and drier. And this means that we're having less trees. We're having less food for the animals. And um, we're having rains when we are not supposed to have rains, which means that uh, the seeds that uh, were supposed to kind of like start germinating when the rains are supposed to fall, it's not happening. So it made a big shift on how the ecosystem is working. So he must be the ranger. Yeah, he's the ranger we've been waiting for. Yeah. Most of the people that are working here um, as rangers uh, come from the pastoral community, so they know how to track the animals and also keeping themselves safe. Somewhere out there on those plains is a rhino and I think she's a black rhino, is that right Ian? Yeah, it's a black rhino. So she has a calf and Ranger Chakana says he's not sure which rhino it is so we're going to go off on foot and see if we can get close enough to get a positive identification from the patterns of the notches on her ears. I'm a little bit worried because it's several hundred meters if not about a kilometer of a hike and uh, I just hope she doesn't come after us because we'll have to get back to the car quickly. It's getting warm. Yeah, it's getting warm already. <laughs> okay. um, and if she charges us, then what do we do? There's this tree you can climb. <laughs> um. <laughs> oh, I can see her. There she is. Yeah. There she is with her calf. Yep. So if in case that uh, she starts coming, Best option is a tree, but... I'm, uh, I'm going to just stay close to you, <laughs> so that I don't... Um, is she facing us? I can't... No, she's facing the other side, but the calf is already hearing us. Can she smell us? No, no, no. That's why we've come on this side, so that uh, we can try and beat the smell. So the wind is blowing from east to west, and we're on the west. We are well clear of her track of smell. But just as Ian said that, the wind changed direction. Now, the rhino could smell us. Ian has taken me on a hike to track a rhino. But just as we got close to her, the wind changed direction. And now she could smell us. Yeah, she might detect us, so we have to go up because the wind is going up like this. Oh, she's, she's got us. She's detected us. Yeah. Oh no. Shall we? <clears throat> what shall we do? Just have to lay low and then, uh, yeah, then we can move back slowly and let her be. She looks like She's wondering, where are they? Mm -hmm. they know, I know they're there somewhere, I just can't see them. Mm -hmm. Even the baby has detected us, look at it. It's got its nose pointing right at us. Oh, yeah. So we're just going to move back slowly, and we're just going to gently walk off um, so that she's left alone and she's back to being herself again. Yeah. All right, so we'll move back slowly, all right? That's as close as I've ever been to a black rhino on foot. And thankfully, I made it away without having to climb a tree. Why should people care about rhinos? Rhinos are like us, and they have been here earlier than we exist as human beings. They're millions and millions and millions of years old. We just came the other day, 
and we're about to kill an entire species. We've killed so many species as human beings. We've made a lot of species go extinct. Two rhino populations have been extinct, the western uh, black rhino and also the northern white rhino. There are only two remaining in the whole world and they are here in Kenya. So why should we watch the extinction of an animal that was there before us? Shouldn't we be feeling so guilty trying to finish a species that has existed over these years? So let's do our duty by protecting these animals as we were sent here on earth to do. Let's make them safe and let's do them populate because we need them for ourselves. We need them for them to be them. We need to see them grow. Ian doesn't just do his patrols by road or on foot. Remarkably, he's also a qualified pilot. And on most days, his patrols are done by air. Despite all this technology, the most efficient anti-poaching team is man's best friend. One of the secrets of the conservation outcomes here at Lewa is the anti-poaching success. And that's because they have the world's best detectors. That is, the dogs. Hi. Hi, hi. <laughs> Simon, hey. <laughs> Habari. Meet the team. Hi, Simon. Yeah. Nice to meet you. And uh, this is? This is Ruby. Ruby. Uh, we'll welcome you to one of our anti poaching units. This is one of the sections. In Lera, we have two sections of security. We have the general security and the anti poaching unit. So for, the, for this one, it's an anti poaching unit, and we have our dog, Ruby. We just got it uh, last month from South Africa, still in training. So she's new? Yeah, she's new. And uh, the other dogs have uh, been deployed to us as another operation. We are not with them today. And I can briefly explain to you the work that we do. Because most of our work uh, is not only conservation. We conserve, but we assist the community. And um, whenever they call us, we usually deploy and we do that free of charge. We don't charge them anything. Oh. Because we want uh, the community to see also the benefit of conservation. For the dogs, uh, like Ruby, it's a bloodhound. They are trained to follow only human scent. You know, the way you are standing now, uh, human scent is defined as small human body particles that are dropping. They are very microscopic, but uh, you cannot see them, you cannot uh, smell them, but the, uh, the dog, because they are very wonderful creatures, they are able to detect that one, and uh, that's what they follow and up to the end, and then we are friend the culprit. Maybe you can uh, today lay a small illustration to you. You can go and hide. And uh, we don't want to see where you are going. We only have to see the starting point. And our dog will help us find you throughout everywhere. So I'll pretend to be a poacher? Yeah, you pretend to be a poacher today. Okay. But today we are not going to eliminate you. Going to <laughs> arrest. You're not going to arrest me? Yeah. Only arresting poachers today. Can I just start anywhere? Yeah, you can just start anywhere. OK, let me, let me go and start over here. She thinks she won't be found. <laughs> See if I can climb this tree. Okay. Now I'm a real poacher hiding in a tree. I can't see her anywhere. Ah! <laughs> I've been caught! <laughs> to think that my son would not be able to see elephants, rhinos, giraffe, all the endangered animals that are with us today in this lifetime is sad and it's devastating. And it has just increased my motivation, it has increased my inspiration to make sure that the animals are there 
they're going to be there. By the time he's turning 25, I would wish that they are still there for him to see in the wild, not in zoos, not in somewhere where they've been bred, but to make sure that he can see them in the wild. The pressure is on because as much as the poaching keeps continuing, as much as people are demanding rhino horn, as much as people are demanding elephant tusk, pangolin scales, all those things, as much as the demand keeps going high, here back home, we will keep on trying to make sure that we keep our animals safe and that he's able to see that. If you want to help our amazing wildlife, why don't you start a Wildlife Warriors Club in your school? To learn more about this program, please visit our website, 